Good morning, everybody. Steve Dreskowski, and um, I'm here joined by uh, Representatives Barr and Munson from the New House Republican Caucus. We have with us some uh, Minnesota citizens who are here concerned as well about an issue of government transparency that you've heard discussed before. Um, we actually began discussing it on the House floor on the first day of session on January 8th, if you remember, uh, the adoption of the uh, the uh, temporary rules as they were introduced on the House floor and the debate that ensued, which is not a traditional thing to happen here in the Minnesota House. Usually the temporary rules uh, just get adopted without debate, but they did have debate this year because we saw what was a radical departure from the process of the past. And uh, uh, I should uh, maybe preface by saying welcome to no committee meetings Fridays. Uh, because that's what we're on today. We um, were told there will be no committee meetings on Fridays, and uh, at 11.30 today, the House Rules Committee will be meeting to discuss and to take testimony on the discussion around the, the uh, permanent rules of the House and what those will be. Uh, I know I was uh, planning to uh, actually be working my other job today, but uh, was surprised last weekend to see that uh, this committee meeting that's going to happen at 11.30 is happening on a day when uh, there's largely not many people here at the Capitol to, to hear about the process. A slow media day, if you will, uh, and uh, so certainly not the best day to hold a committee meeting, and certainly uh, there is some hypocrisy in the notion that uh, we're going to hold a, a very important committee meeting on a day when the committee was not supposed to meet uh, and so we can certainly have more discussions about that as we go forward uh, but we are here to talk about the fact uh, that the uh, the Democrat majority is is working to grease the skids to bring their agenda through the legislature as quickly as they can in the House uh, evidently they want to uh, bring as many of those bills through as quickly as possible uh, and when that happens uh, ladies and gentlemen, what we end up with is the inability for the public to take part in that process, to understand what is being brought before them, and to uh, uh, really uh, get a good deliberative process like our Constitution and vision, like our founders and vision, like past legislatures have had. And so we're here concerned about that today. Minnesotans want the light turned back on so they can see the legislative process and become fully involved in it. Today, uh, we call on the House Majority Democrats to adopt permanent rules that allow a full and deliberate public participation, just like we had in the last two biennia, just like the Senate uses today. Uh, we would like to have that, that open process that includes having the bills actually go when they're passed out of committee or referred out of committee to the House floor for the full 134 members of the Minnesota House to vote to be referred then to another committee for known public discussion and participation. And then if they are referred out of that committee, back to the House again for discussion and for referral back to the third committee so that people in Minnesota can follow those bills as they go, understand where they are, and fully participate in them. That is not what we have in front of us. You heard the discussion on the House floor uh, on the opening day of session. What we have instead is a big uh, monster committee, the Ways and Means Committee, which all of these bills are referred to initially, and only by memo of one person, the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee then, uh, those bills are referred to who knows which committee and can then be pulled back to the House Ways and Means Committee with a similar memo and go, gone to another committee back and forth a variety of times to allow that bill to move and touch the committees that the House rules requires it to touch, many times with the public unknowing of where that bill is going or having a chance in that process. Uh, with a nearly $50 billion budget being discussed, to have every single bill that will constitute that budget of 50, nearly $50 billion controlled by one person does not resemble freedom. And, you know, uh, Representative Carlson, the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, has been said to be a nice person. I agree with that. He's a nice person. Uh, but a nice person given tyrannical powers is a nice tyrant. And that's not what we're looking for here today. And I'll turn it over to Representative Munson. Thank you. I'm Jeremy Munson from House District 23B. Uh, it's in southern Minnesota. Most importantly, it's about a two-hour drive from the Capitol. 
from, from constituents in my district to come up here and to testify in committee on bills that they support or oppose. Um, I'm, I'm a legislator in the minority. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, last year when I was in the majority, I voted against these omnibus bills where they roll hundreds of bills into one. So that put me in the minority of the majority. It's really important for me to have transparency in government. And a lot of constituents out there are asking for it. Uh, we saw this on the campaign trail this last session where both Democrats and Republicans talked about the need for transparency in government and to hold legislators accountable. And when you have hundreds of bills rolled up into one, you can't hold your legislator accountable for their votes. These omnibus bills are created in committees. And it's important that as bills come to committee that we work to amend these bills to make them uh, possibly better, um, to have public input in these bills. And if people do not have uh, adequate notice so that they can schedule time off of work um, to come up and, and testify in committee, we take the transparency out of government. If bills can flip from committee to committee and hearings can shift uh, just with the click of a mouse, the people cannot witness or bear witness to this legislative process. I've heard that the Democrats think this is a more efficient way of doing things. But if, you, if efficiency is what you seek, then, then just be efficient. But these rules do not, these, these rules promote haste and such haste is not efficient. We need to let the people be heard. Due process, careful thought, and democracy matter. And I urge my Democratic colleagues to reject these rules and support the rules that we had under the last biennium. Representative Barr, did you have a few words to say as well? Thank you. Uh, Representative Cal Barr, 31B, North Anoka County. Uh, since I've been at the legislature, all one term and starting the second one now, Transparency on anti-omnibus bills has been kind of my main driving force. The last session, when these bills went through committee, which the process then I agreed with, where each, every committee, after each committee, they'd go back to the floor for a full vote by the entire House. Any amendments were incorporated or engrossed into the original bill, so as, as it went through each committee stop, you could see the changes that were made on the prior, by the prior committees. I agreed with that process, but when it, we got done with all of the committee assignments, those bills would get rolled into an omnibus bill. And if you're trying to track a specific piece of legislation, you're tracking by a House file number or a Senate file number. Those Senate file numbers became irrelevant at that point because there was no tracking on the, on the revisor's website or at, as you're tracking the bill. There is no method to track whether this has been rolled into an omnibus bill. So for me, it's, it's the omnibus bill as a whole and the lack of transparency used to uh, the, the, the transparency, we were transparent up until the end of committee and then transparency stopped at, after committees and the, uh, the omnibus bill and the darkness started. Now this, what is happening today with this proposed rule change in the uh, um, non-committee committee day is extending that lack of transparency from after the committee process to before the committee process. It's just making making the public less aware of what's going on. It, it's, it's the shell game, it's the three card Monty, it's you have no idea. So as, as they, the others before me have mentioned with greasing the skids, that's exactly what it is because it's an, it's an agenda that if a full transparency was shined on it, the majority of Minnesotans would not accept everything that's in, this, in these monster bills and this, uh, this agenda that they're trying to pull th push through. They may agree in concept, but when the devil is always in the details, and when you start looking at the details of these bills, there's a lot of devils in there. And the, the majority of Minnesotans do not believe and do not uh, adhere to the principles that are uh, enshrined in these bills, in, in these little devils inside. So for those reasons, I also call on my Democratic colleagues to revert to the old process, reject these rules, and go back to the full committee process where the, we go to the floor after each committee stop, have the bills re-engrossed, and then put in, get rid of the omnibus bills to boot. Bring transparency to the, the entire, entire process and uh, let the people of Minnesota um, uh, let the people of Minnesota participate in the process and have their voice heard and, and adhere to the wishes of the people that we were sent here to represent. Thank you, Representative Barr. Um, you know, as a legislator, it's important that we also be able to give, to be, to, we be given adequate notice to amend bills. And many of these subcommittees of Ways and Means maintain the rule of 24-hour notice required in order to submit an amendment on a bill. 
if this new structure uh, that they're creating today allows bills to be referred to multiple committees in one day, then we are not able to amend bills under these rules. And this impacts our legislative process, our research, staff be, our, our research staff being able to adequately research and propose amendments to bills, but it also has a major impact on, 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 the, on the public being able to testify. So with us today is Elizabeth Bangert, uh, who's a resident of uh, St. Peter, and she's here to, to express concern over this uh, rule change because it impacts uh, her ability to track bills as well. Elizabeth. Good morning, I'm Elizabeth Bangert, and I am a citizen lobbyist. I say that because these halls of this Capitol are not filled with people any longer. They are now filled, <clears throat> excuse me, with paid lobbyists. I spent over 30 days last year testifying at the Capitol. I'm a small business owner and child care center um, owner as well. And it's extremely difficult for me to plan this year as compared to last year, because I always knew when the committee was meeting and where the bill was. Now today I wake up and House File 1 and 30, which directly seek to expand government in a massive capacity and directly impact my business, have moved yet again from what I refer to as the hide and seek committee also known as Ways and Means, over through two committees now without my having the ability or any of my fellow child care providers to come up and testify on something that directly impacts us. There are five and a half million people in this state right now who are about to be silenced by one, although he be nice individual, what will soon become tyrant, one person having control of five and a half million people's lives and decisions that impact them. So I'm asking for transparency to restore and keep the rules the way that they were last year. Um, bills should not be just traveling through like this. It's unacceptable. And as citizens, you should come up to the Capitol and take back your government. How's your last name spelled? B-A-N-G-E-R-T. Thank you, Bangert. Okay. okay, I think we passed out to people here a, a copy of the first 155 bills that have uh, been introduced in the four, first four legislative days of this legislature. Um, these bills have all been referred to uh, the Hide and Seek Committee, uh, the Ways and Means Committee, and um, and nobody beyond that, we don't know, well, we can look on the website and at least know where they were initially re-referred to, but there's no certainty of where any of these bills are today because the power of the Ways and Means Chair to move them at will at any minute uh, exists. And so the question exists for the people of Minnesota as outlined by my colleagues and Ms. Bangert. Um, and I did read an account in the media should be very interested in this um, of a, a media actually, I think it was WCCO had one of their stories. Well, the bill was referred to the Ways and Means Committee. And the reality is that you in the media don't have the ability to give accurate or complete definition to the people of Minnesota of where that bill is. Because it really isn't going to end up in the Ways and Means Committee. It's going to end up somewhere else. And you can't say where that is because you don't know. And you can't be accurate about it either. So I think, I think um, ladies and gentlemen, you need to be concerned about that. These bills are here. Uh, I challenge anyone to uh, show the public with 100% accuracy that they know where these are going to be. And as we go forward, um, it's important for us to work to turn the lights back on for the people of Minnesota because democracy dies in darkness. Thank you. Any questions? Um, why do you think the Supreme Court is so reluctant to take and enforce cases that raise single subject rule issues. So I, the Supreme Court's actually made three pretty significant rulings in the last four decades on the single subject clause. And I believe they're reluctant to do, to actually strike these down as, as if you look into the, their, their opinion, they would actually shut the government down if they struck these down. They, they're given a choice you either reject the whole bill, which these are funding bills, we're in the new biennium, which would, if they struck it down, that would defund everything that's in that bill. So it's a public safety bill, you're, you're losing your firemen, your policemen, any, anything that goes through public safety, anything that's financed through the public safety um, uh, bill, if that was the particular you know, omnibus bill they were working on, or transportation, or education, they would strike down every funding piece because we're in a new biennium. The legislature has adjourned. It's not like we can come back without the governor's uh, uh, ask. The governor has to actually ask us to come back or 
Their other option is to become a super legislature where they pick pieces out of that bill and say, well, we'll keep this, we'll get rid of that. We'll keep this one piece, but everything else violates single subject. And we don't want the Supreme, we've, we've complained about the uh, different courts, uh, federal Supreme Court or different courts throughout the, the, the land legislating from the bench. So we don't want that either. So that's why they've been reluctant is they don't really want to be put in a position where they're the, the boogeyman by closing down the entire government. And they also don't want to be a super legislature, so they have called on us to be uh, more accountable. And to that, to that end, we will probably be having another press conference in approximately three weeks. Uh, I will be rolling out a, uh, an, a constitutional amendment to clarify the single subject clause and give the Supreme Court the ability to uh, the ability to strike down these bills without being defunding the government and also put a, f a little more restraint on the legislature at the same time, but uh, that'll be about three weeks from now. So the same tactic that legislators use to force the hand of a governor to not veto a big bill is, you think, the similar tactic to what is used to keep the Supreme Court from striking down? It, yes, yeah. it's, it's basically the same tactic. You put, put things into a bill that there is no way that you want to, sh nobody wants to turn the cops off. Nobody wants their fire protection turned off, which is where we'd be, and if the legislature has adjourned, because the, by the time these, these single subject bills or these omnibus bills make it to the Supreme Court, you're talking July, August, September, we adjourn in the third week of May, you have, they have to strike it down, which means in, as soon as it's struck down, everything that was in that bill is immediately defunded because we're in a new biennium, so there is no funding, period. It's done. Now you gotta get the governor to call us back. We have to get legislators from all over the state back here who have other jobs, because this is only a part-time job. 90% of us have outside jobs uh, uh, other than the legislature. We have to make arrangements to get out of that. It's a, a three-day callback time. So now you're another three days without fire or police protection, if that's the particular bill, would we'll stay on the public safety bill for, for purposes of this. And, and then you have to actually get this. We'd be waiving the rules. Then, A, because we're skipping the committee process, you'd have to waive the rules. We'd have to have an open debate on the floor, which could take a couple, three days. And then you'd have to split this apart into the multiple bills so you're actually not going to pass one bill. You'd have to take the public safety bill, split it back into all the pieces that made it up, debate each one of those on the floor, pass them off, get the Senate to do the same thing. If there's any differences, go back through a conference committee, then back to each chamber again, and then you get to go to the governor to refund the government. That process could take two to three weeks. Do you think that there's any uh, benefit to having bills that have multiple subjects so that you folks can so that so that well, legislature can get leverage against the governor, uh, or would you, as a new Republican caucus, forsake using uh, using that kind of leverage? Well, I think it's important uh, to, uh, to what uh, Representative Barr said. Um, it is a lot of work to vote every bill up and down on its own merits, but it is what we are paid to do. It's why we're here. It's what people elected us to do is to to give every bill that we can a hearing and to make sure that we're only voting through legislation that's good. Um, as far as bundling stuff together and putting all our eggs in one basket for the governor, I don't think that's a great process. Um, there'll be legislation if we vote on single subject bills, there'll be bills that I don't agree with 100%, but it's a compromise. And if I vote for legislation that the other side wants, I expect them to vote for bills that, that I like. That's, that's what it's about. It isn't rolling it all into one, it's, it's, it's working as a team and working across the aisles and voting on legislation that we can agree on. So and if they, if they vote bills down that, that, uh, on the other side of that compromise, then they've lost trust in our side. So you would say that you, as a lawmaker, or perhaps you folks as a caucus, as a new Republican caucus, would forsake multiple subjects in bills? Well, you're looking at three legislators uh, who last year, while we were in the majority, voted against omnibus bills, even though they were put together by our own caucus and, and were some of our bills in those omnibus bills. We voted against I them on principle. I understand that, okay, but let's say you're running things, okay, and then and, and the way it turns out with the last election, you're, you're not, this, even the full Republican caucus isn't. But are you saying that, that if the Republicans are, are running the Minnesota House of Representatives that they ought not to use multiple subject bills at all for the, for the, for the purity of this? Uh, the, are you going to forsake that, that leverage is, is my question. Representative Draskowski, I want to ask you that because you've been around here for a long time. Well, we have the single subject clause in the Constitution. The people of Minnesota put that in the Constitution for a reason. 
And I think Representative Barr outlined very well uh, some of the details around the problems that have come through the courts. The question is, what was the original intent of Minnesotans, our, our founders, if you will, when they put that together? Uh, it seems clear to me that it was that it would be uh, one subject expressed in its title. And the notion that uh, you're going to roll a governor by putting things in there in order to uh, leverage him or her is wrong. Uh, we don't have to look much further than last session with the um, multi-hundred million dollar garbage bill uh, that was vetoed by the governor. So it didn't work. And it's a strategy that um, takes the power and authority away from Minnesotans and puts it into three leaders, the governor, the Speaker of the House, and the majority leader in the Senate. It strips the authority uh, vested in the legislators in all 134 House members and all 67 senators and puts it in the hands of three people and deprives the people who voted for those individuals of their representation uh, here at the Capitol. It's wrong and for those reasons, not the, the whole strategy of uh, if we roll these all in one bill, are we going to get the governor to uh, buy it or are we going to force him into signing it? Obviously, it doesn't always work. It's not a good strategy. We should go back to what the founder said. So the only way it's going to work is it's, if, if you, you can't do it unilaterally because otherwise you're going to get rolled, obviously, in the process. So it seems, and this is, I guess, playing into some, one of the comments that, that you made, Representative, um, the only way you can do it is to clarify what the, what, uh, what the Constitution says, right? Is that Absolutely. correct? Well, we also have the power of the citizens of Minnesota to elect representatives who will, who will pursue single subject bills. We have the power to do this, and we are supposed to be doing this. And we need citizens to understand that, that the legislature is not doing this, and they need to hold their legislators accountable. Can I, yep. I just want to add something. I hear the word leverage a lot, and as a citizen, I hate that word. I am a conservative, and last year, I got help from no one with over 3,000 pages of public DHS data compiled that shows DHS is literally coming after private providers while the public school remains unchecked. So all I kept hearing was, well, that's not part of our plan. We need to leverage this. You, I don't want to be a pawn in someone's game. When I elect someone, I'm not giving five and a half million people's power to 134 individuals. I want a voice. I demand a voice, actually, which is why I'm up here. If I have to be up here every single day, I will figure it out for my business. But Representative Munson is absolutely right. This government is supposed to be by the people, for the people, and we the people are tired of being silenced by paid lobbyists. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.